good morning. It is a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I've been to uh, Denmark several times, but this is the first time when I speak in Copenhagen. So it's a great honor and it's a great pleasure to meet all of you. It is also an extra extraordinary pleasure for me to listen very carefully to the speech just now by Professor Schiller. I was a student at Yale for four years, and each time when a Yale professor speaks, I listen very carefully. So I benefited a great deal. Now, the organizer of this conference asked me to talk about soft landing or hard landing in China. As a rule of thumb, I realized that whenever you talk about a particular incident in China, it is better to put it in a historical perspective. So before I talk about the landing issue, allow me to speak a little bit about China over the past 30 years or so, but also with a view of looking forward to China, at least to China 2020. So that's the uh, uh, topic we are going to uh, talk about. Now, let me see how do I. Mastering the technology is always important. Ah, this one. Ah, so I use this one. Okay, thank you. Um, let me uh, start with uh, showing you a picture. Um, uh, if you recognize one of the two persons in this picture, you probably already passed the test of history. <laughs> if you recognize both of them, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is not a picture to show uh, advertisement of cigarette or secondhand smoking. This shows that when someone speaks like Professor Schiller that did just now, I listen very intently. But I also try to interpret whatever that man said. Now, by showing this picture, I would say that China really has benefited tremendously from the direction that Deng Xiaoping had set for China. For the last 30 years or so, China has been embarking on a profound transformation as outlined by Deng Xiaoping. And we are such beneficiary of his wisdom and uh, a direction for China and what transformation has been brought about. And uh, also, I understand many of you are actually fund managers. And uh, this picture actually shows you that back in 1986, when the former chairman of New York Stock Exchange, John Phelan, visited China, he was met with Deng Xiaoping. At that time, China had no stock market at all. And it was during this meeting, uh, where I was doing the interpretation, that Deng Xiaoping said that one day China would have its own stock market. And you know, as of November last year, uh, China celebrated the 20th year anniversary of the founding of the Shanghai Stock Exchange. So again, um, in a matter of a couple of decades, China has taken great strides. You may also know that somewhere last year, there was an IPO by Agricultural Bank of China, which raised more than 20 billion US dollars. And that IPO actually was listed on Shanghai Stock Exchange and Hong Kong Stock Exchange. It was not listed in the United States. And when I was a banker with Morgan Stanley back in the 1990s, it was beyond any comprehension that a big IPO raising more than 20 billion US dollars could have been done without tapping into uh, uh, the US stock, uh, stock market. So you can see that changes are really happening as we speak. But if we put all the things that we are talking about in a historical perspective, let me remind ourselves that as a matter of fact, China was a top dog. China was the largest economy in the world for many centuries, uh, especially before the beginning of the Industrial uh, Revolution. As we can see that uh, China actually remained the largest economy all the way till uh, 1895, when the United States took it over from China, even though we know that ever since 1840, when the first Opium War started, when uh, Britain uh, started to encroach more and more into China, the uh, economy in China suffered, mainly because China at that time was a very large agricultural 
uh, economy and uh, it was you know, far away from the industrialization uh, process and eventually it suffered a uh, fall from grace, as we call. Uh, we do not have time to go into details as to why China declined from being number one in the world, from uh, the top of the world and suffered such a sharp decline. But you can read about what I have tried my best to summarize from that to such an extent that over the past 100 years, starting from 1911, when the uh, uh, empire was overthrown, the Manchu Empire was overthrown, there were three important individuals in the Chinese history. Dr. Sun Yat-sen founded the Republic of China in 1911, and then Mao Zedong founded the People's Republic of China in 1949, and then most importantly, I think, of direct relevance to what we are witnessing today in China as well as in the world, uh, Deng Xiaoping re-emerging from exile in, eight, uh, in 1978, becoming the paramount leader of China and really ensuring that China is coming out of the box and embarking upon such a great transformation. We also want to be reminded that back in 1978, China's total foreign exchange reserve was as little as 168 million US dollars. Probably most people in this audience manage money more than that amount. Uh, I was told uh, before I started to work with him, around 1980 or so, there was a big meeting in Beijing. And during the meeting, Deng Xiaoping said, comrades, one day China's foreign reserve may reach 10 billion uh, US dollars and nobody believed him. Silence fell on the audience. Because at that time, 10 billion was like an astronomical number. But we also know that right now, China's total foreign exchange reserve uh, has reached 3.2 trillion US dollars, the largest foreign exchange reserve in the world. And also China has become the largest creditor nation to the United States. Now, according to my calculation, Ever since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there has been never any country with relatively speaking lower per capita income becoming the largest accredited nation to the only surviving superpower in the world. And all this, I think, is attributable to what Deng Xiaoping emphasized again and again when he re-emerged out of exile. That is, the top priority is development. Development is the hard truth, as he emphasized again and again. And he basically said, forget about ideological dispute, arguments about whether socialism would be superior to capitalism or vice versa, because eventually, whoever can create jobs, whoever who can bring bread and butter to the table, he has the better ideology. So this is the guiding principle for China ever since then. So what exactly is China today? I would say that China today is still very much living in the long shadow of Deng Xiaoping, and the subsequent two generations of the leaders, the third generation and the incumbent fourth generation of the Chinese leaders, are more or less caretakers of Deng Xiaoping's legacy. And Deng Xiaoping actually has turned out to be a prophet for the Chinese nation. He actually prophesied all the way till the middle of this century. So right now, in 2012, we are still very much in the middle of what he has set out for China. But even during a very short period of 32 or 33 years, great transformation has already taken place in China and also indirectly through China to the whole world. By now, China is already the second largest economy in the world. China overtook Italy, France, Britain, Germany, and Japan respectively in less than a decade. That's really very, very fast transformation. By now, China has become the number one producer in a dozen of uh, items, actually three or four dozen of items, including iron and steel, cement, chemical fiber, and the automobile. Now, if you ever care a little bit about studying Industrial Revolution, you will realize that since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there have been only a handful of countries which have become the number one producer and user of iron and steel. Since around the time of 1995 to 1996, China has been the largest producer and user of iron and steel. And last year, China actually produced around 700 million iron and steel product. 
And as I mentioned, China is already the largest credit nation to the United Nations, largest foreign uh, reserve uh, in the world. And also, as we will discuss a little bit more, China actually may overtake the United States to become the largest economy in the world. But it is much more than that. If we look a little bit more uh, in details, uh, China is also the largest mobile phone market with 980 million mobile phone users, the largest internet market with more than 500 million users. And it is something beyond my comprehension and anticipation. China has become the largest manufacturer and users of automobiles. 2011 production is more than 20 million vehicles in China, way ahead of the United States. And also, China is building the fastest and the largest high-speed railway line, and by the end of last year, altogether 13,000 kilometers of high-speed railway uh, is already in uh, operation. Actually, a few days ago, I was traveling from Stanford, Connecticut to Washington, D.C. by a seller, and I can assure you that the highest speed a railway in China runs much better than Amtrak, runs much better than a seller. So in the sense, I think China has managed to build up probably one of the best infrastructure network, including highways, railways, high-speed railways, uh, aviation networks, port facilities, etc. So going forward, I think the competitiveness of the Chinese manufacturing uh, industries will be more and more based not because of the cheap labor that was the predominant factor in the first couple of decades of China's industrialization process, but more and more so on the uh, uh, high quality uh, infrastructure network, on the existence of you know, skilled labor pool, on uh, availability of funding for uh, research and development, and also on the dedication and the commitment and high discipline of the uh, workforce. So what exactly is China today? I think we l hear a lot about China, we talk a lot about China, we actually think a lot about China. In Europe, there is a lot of talk about whether China will come to the rescue of uh, Euro. And uh, it is indeed, you know, many sovereign nations, including Germany, France, etc., they actually talk to the Chinese government increasingly. So and IMF and other international organizations are also very much in discussion with China about what exactly can be the role that China can play in the turbulent world as we are faced with right now. Because when the United States is being stalled, has been stalled in its growth with a lot of gridlock in Washington DC, and when European Union itself as a whole is still struggling with a lot of uncertainty and disunity, and the prospect of Euro is still very uncertain. The role that China can play today is becoming more and more important. But what exactly is China today? Uh, is China still a communist country? Uh, as uh, some members of Congress in Washington DC are still accustomed to do that. Is China still a red China? Is China a socialist China? What does that mean uh, to be socialism with Chinese characteristics as Deng Xiaoping I mentioned 32 years ago. Or more recently, there are some scholars have called China as state capitalism. Is China still a new China? Or in my term, I've been calling China since 1978 as the new, new China. So what exactly is China today? Now, we can talk about that and then we can come up with our own, own views. Uh, Professor Schiller just now talked about animal spirits and I listened very carefully to that. But uh, I, I would hesitate to describe the animal spirits in China. Uh, so I would like to talk about the human spirits in China or the prevailing mentalities in China. Actually, it's something very, very difficult to uh, uh, conceptualize. But if you can imagine yourself going to China and talk to all the 1.34 billion Chinese people and come up with your view of what exactly are the prevailing mentalities of the human spirits, this is the short list I will prepare for you. I would say in China, very, very predominantly, you see pragmatism, realism, mercantilism, secularism, globalism, innovation, experimentalism, a dare to do spirit, and uh, flexibility and a forward-looking uh, spirit. 
uh, Professor Schiller just now also talked about 10 years of decline of confidence in the United States. And there is no end to that, at least in the immediate future. But in China, it's just the opposite. I personally can sense a high level of optimism, a firm belief that today is better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better than today. On the other hand, there is no self-congratulation, there is no complacency, there is no dancing on the street uh, when China surpasses Italy or Britain or France or Germany or Japan. Uh, there is a dedication and commitment to do what we need to do to increase productivity. And also, I think very importantly, there is a long-term vision as charted out by Deng Xiaoping 30 years ago with a constant readjustment almost on a daily basis. And this is especially important because China and uh, the people over there are faced with new challenges, new situations, and there is no institutional knowledge base for us to draw any precedence upon. Every day is new. Every day, for example, the economic disparity between the United States and China is narrowing. The gap is narrowing. By now, China is already the second largest economy in the world. And also, I think there is a strong desire and commitment to do the best in the world or the largest in the world. You know, we just heard in the news that Brazil may not be able to finish the stadium for the uh, uh, FIFA uh, soccer uh, game and the expenditure will be probably uh, above uh, uh, budget, etc. But in China, if you look at the Beijing Olympics in 2008, Shanghai World Expo and uh, the Asian Games, etc., uh, one case after another, there is plenty of proof that the nation is becoming capable of delivering uh, results and embarking and completing mega deals uh, uh, and the desire to do the best or the largest deals in the world uh, actually can uh, be translated into a reality. And also, there is a strong desire for stability at home and peace in the world in order to achieve economic development at home. Now, by mentioning peace in the world, it does not mean that China single-handedly will be able to deliver peace in the world. It is actually more narrowly defined. It means that China wants to do whatever it can to stay away from military conflicts or armed conflicts in the world. Whenever there is a conflict, China does not want to have anything to do with that. And also, I think there is a strong desire and commitment to refuse to be bogged down by dogmatism ideologism, ophicification, inflexibility, immobilism, or self-proclaimed truths, or self-indulgent fantasies. I list this short list of things mainly because China actually uh, uh, was involved in each and every one of them. Uh, for example, uh, self-proclaimed truths. In China right now, the general consensus is that we don't have the truth. Whatever we can do is to get closer and closer to the truth. But you cannot reach the truth itself because once you believe you, can, you possess the truth, you lock yourself up in the box. That means pragmatism and experimentalism and uh, the desire to always do the experiments to test the truth against the uh, uh, practice uh, will become uh, the uh, dominant theme going forward. Now, I would say, um, soft landing or hard landing aside, I would say the Chinese economy uh, will continue to grow at about 8% uh, GDP growth per year for at least the coming couple of decades. And China's economy, or the GDP in total, is expected to quadruple again uh, in the coming 15 or 18 years. Now. Uh, we will go into more details later, but there is one mega question which remains unresolved and still very unclear. Uh, that is, while people ask a lot as to when uh, will China surpass the United States as the largest economy in the world, uh, in China, actually, there is no doubt about it. If you talk to the government leaders, if you talk to the very senior leaders in the corporate or in the financial institutions, there is no doubt about it at all that China will become the largest economy in the world. Uh, the only difference is timing. When that will be, that's uncertain. And uh, therefore, my answer to that mega question 
is that China may surpass the United States as the largest economy in the world faster than many previous estimates. Now, IMF actually already came up with a forecast using 2016 as the year when the Chinese economy will be bigger than the United States, but they are using the PPP as the basis. And in China, we do not want to use the PPP. We want to use the nominal exchange rate as the basis of comparison. However, whatever you use and whatever date you pick, I think uh, uh, that milestone event will happen uh, during the lifetime, I hope, of all the people present in the audience today. And that doesn't mean that China has a smooth sailing in the coming few decades. Um, that doesn't mean that China does not have challenges domestic as well as uh, international. For example, domestically, there are lots of challenges. And I can tell you, most of the reports, negative reports you read in New York Times, International Herald Tribune, and the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, are true. There are lots of these problems in China, but they actually do not reflect the totality of the situation in China. Now, when you think about China, it's really mind-boggling because in terms of the population, China's population is bigger, larger, than the total uh, population of all the OECD countries combined. What does that mean? You know, we are talking about the 70 Euro countries, 27 EU members, uh, but if you combine all of them together, plus United States, Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Japan, for example, and plus some other countries on top of that, you still do not have as big a population as China's. India's population is catching up very quickly, but in terms of the land size, China is about three times as big as India. So you are talking about really an entity which is so big, so significant, and so complicated that there are, of course, not surprising at all, huge amount of challenges. And on the top of my list, I would put corruption, uh, a lack of trust. We are in a Nordic country, and uh, I think uh, this trust between the government and society at large, uh, transparency, uh, confidence, for example, etc., uh, really put the Nordic countries apart. In China, there is uh, eroding trust between the government and the people, and corruption is becoming very much of a problem. Uh, instability is very much of a problem, lots of disputes involving land use rights, and uh, a labor unrest, for example, um, and income polarization, and on top of that, we have the traditional short list, including Taiwan independence, Tibet independence, Xinjiang, for example, and Falun Gong, etc. So, the, sh the challenges in China are numerous, and I think uh, uh, for the sake of China, as well as for stability and growth in the world, we need to help China to solve these domestic challenges. Internationally, there are also many challenges. On the other hand, I think the country is, believe it or not, committed to political reform. Now, I always ask the question in a reverse way. How can anyone truly believe that China can have made such tremendous amount of economic transformation without corresponding political reform and a transformation uh, together. Uh, both President Hu Jintao and Deng Xiaoping during his lifetime emphasized again and again that there will be no modernization without democracy in China. So China will continue with the political reform, but China will not adopt the, what it considers as the Western-style democracy and will try to maintain its one-party rule while enhancing greater popular participation in the decision-making uh, process. And on this point, I think uh, many people in Europe or in North America, in Japan, may have different views with the decision-makers in China as to what exactly constitutes uh, a democracy. Uh, India always calls itself the largest democracy in the world. Um, uh, and, and the Chinese uh, perception of that is very different. Uh, but I think we are living in a world of diversity, so maybe we can be tolerant with each other and give China a little bit more time, let it try itself out, let do, let's do its experiment to see what exactly can come out, not only on the economic front, which we have already seen such economic miracles and transformation, but also on the political side to see whether that road to political reform can eventually also succeed. Now, the, the 
major unanswered questions I want to discuss with you very briefly is this China-U.S. relations. Both China and the United States call the bilateral relations as the most important pair of bilateral relations in the world in the 21st century. However, I personally believe the United States uh, may have not yet come to terms with the prospect that China may eventually surpass the United States. You know, some people in the United States saying, say this doesn't matter. You know, China, given the large population, etc., and faster rate of growth, eventually will surpass uh, the United States. But on a per capita basis, the United States will remain uh, way ahead of China for many, many decades to come. And in terms of economic power, etc., the United States will be way ahead of China. But on the other hand, for any country to become the largest economy in the world in historical terms, uh, there is actually a lot of implications to that. And I think this time, this prospect of having another country, in this case, China, surpassing the United States eventually, uh, this prospect has never loomed as realistically as this time in the case of China, ever since the Second World War. So how eventually the United States will deal with that prospect and how China and the United States will handle their bilateral relations in such a way that, that they can cooperate with each other, they do not view each other as threat or as enemies, and eventually the whole world will be benefiting from a better relations between Washington and Beijing. That probably will not only be a challenge for China and the United States, but for the world in general. And also, coming back very quickly about the megatrends in China. Uh, let me summarize very quickly. Industrialization, modernization, urbanization, and globalization. Now, for any major economies in the world, sooner or later, at different stage in history, you will need to go through one or all of these stages. But the amazing thing for China is that all these four megatrends more or less happen simultaneously. Because in historical terms, 33 years is actually a very short period of time. And in this short period of time, China is fastly industrializing. Now it's already the workshop of the world, and China is modernizing very, very quickly. Urbanization, in terms of urbanization, 2011 marked the first year when the urban registered residents in China surpassed the rural residents. But it's not clear cut 50 50 because among the rural population, Right now, as we speak, there are about 250 million or more of rural populations who migrate to work in the, in the cities. They are indeed a migrant. They move from one city to another. They sometimes work part-time in the cities, but eventually go back to the countryside. Many of them increasingly choose to stay behind in the cities. So if you include the migrant population in the cities, originally from the countryside, urbanization may be actually much bigger than the uh, uh, 50%. So I think, uh, and globalization is happening as we speak. And I personally will call the year 2012 as the year one in the true sense of the word of Chinese companies coming out into the world. And don't be surprised if more and more Chinese companies and financial institutions will be engaged in mega cross-border transactions. And we also hear a lot about renminbi. And I would say uh, another mega trend going forward is that uh, renminbi right now is already convertible under the current account, but it is uh, not fully convertible freely under the capital accounts. But eventually there will be full convertibility of the renminbi and the exchange rate wise, it will be market readjustability of the exchange rate. But what if the Chinese renminbi achieves full convertibility and the market readjustability of the exchange rate. The end result of that, even though there will be many things, technical things that need to be eventually lined up, will mean that the renminbi yuan will eventually become a global reserve currency. As a matter of fact, the more you think about it, uh, ever since the end of the Second World War, there has never been a, a country which is the second largest economy in the world whose currency is not used more or less as a reserve currency. So China is the only exception right now. The Chinese yuan is not used as a reserve currency, but 
this will all change in the coming years. And I think if you notice the fact that the Japanese Prime Minister during Christmas time when he visited China, Japan officially requested that the Japanese government to want to buy and hold Chinese renminbi treasury bond. Now this, in historical term, will be a milestone event. And I don't think many people uh, in the world or in this audience included uh, may actually fully understood the implications of that. That means one big uh, a Western country, one of the OECD member country, officially now wants to hold renminbi uh, as part of its uh, bond holdings or uh, uh, reserve currency holdings. And I would not be surprised if more and more countries will follow the suit. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm already aware that several other countries are already in discussion informally with the Chinese government uh, about holding directly renminbi uh, treasury bond. On the other hand, I think this uh, increasing dependence on foreign supply of energy and raw material is becoming more and more of a concern, especially when you look at unstable situations in the Gulf, for example, and the prospect of uh, closing of the Homo uh, Strait. All this actually can send uh, jitteries uh, to China, making the Chinese economy or the uh, economic prospect more fragile going forward. But on the other hand, uh, there is a rapid emergence of the uh, middle class. As a matter of fact, uh, there are uh, different estimates about China already becoming the largest country producing new millionaires or uh, billionaires uh, in the world. But coming again, coming back again to the human spirits or the animal spirits, as the professor says, uh, I think uh, another mega trend is very fascinating. That is, in China, truly, uh, there is a race a renaissance, there is a firm belief that there is a renaissance in terms of the national psyche and cultural development, and there is a breaking away from either a superiority complex or an inferiority complex, and an attempt to achieve a psychological balance as equals with the world. And this probably will be very significant because uh, China used to, for many years, view itself as a superior. Uh, to uh, other cultures, or ever since the beginning of the Opium War, it had developed an inferiority complex because it was invaded and bullied by many other countries. But now I think after 32 years or so of tremendous amount of transformation, there is an equalization of view, there is a balance of the view. There is, I think, for the first time in the Chinese long civilization that we are equal to the world. We are not above the world, we are not below the world, we are equal to the world. That will really change the mentality when the Chinese nation will engage the rest of the world and also provide tremendous amount of impetus uh, uh, to the globalization drive in China. Now, another mega trend uh, includes innovation because right now it is increasingly emphasized in China about uh, innovation from made in China to invented in China. And we know that in this city, Copenhagen, there was the Copenhagen uh, conference where unfortunately China and the United States actually clashed about their uh, commitments and responsibilities. Uh, however, I would say even though China is now already the biggest emitter of uh, CO2, uh, uh, there is increasingly awareness and commitment to do what we call the green development. Uh, we want to elevate green development to the hard truth to the soft truth and to the smart truth. And development, uh, which Deng Xiaoping called the hard truth, is no longer development as it is, purely in the hard sense of the word, infrastructure, roads, etc. Development is increasingly including both hard development and soft development as well as smart development. And also, amazingly, China has really emerged as a champion of free trade and market economy. And I think uh, increasingly so, when the world is uh, encountering a lot of uh, pressure points, when jobs are becoming a problem, unemployment is getting uh, worse, uh, there will be an uh, increasing tendency towards uh, protectionism. And I think uh, China being a uh, champion of free trade and market economy will have a very important role to uh, play. now. The population aging is also becoming a problem. 
But I just want to mention very briefly that the aging population phenomenon in China is very largely due to the one-child policy which China has been implementing for about 40 years. And uh, China actually has credited it itself for contributing to the sustainable global economic development by being very strict on the family planning issue, even though family planning has been controversial. Some other countries actually criticize China for the family planning policy because it, it infringes on human rights, for example. But in China, we basically say that if there were no family planning policy for the last 40 years, the Chinese population probably would have grown bigger by anywhere between 25, 250 million or even bigger than that. So I think uh, uh, the uh, aging population phenomenon in China is very different from that in Russia or in France or in Japan and several other countries. And uh, eventually I would say that the uh, family planning policy need to be very much readjusted in the coming years or decades. And also political reform, as I just now mentioned, uh, will need to be uh, uh, further uh, promoted. Now, uh, the previous speaker, Professor Schiller, talked about bubbles, property bubbles, uh, and uh, irrational exuberance, etc. Indeed, uh, there has also been a lot of exuberance, uh, many of which uh, irrational in China too, in the property sector. But let me just put it very briefly here uh, because of the constraint of time. Uh, I personally don't think there is one property bubble in China. Why? Uh, mainly because uh, in China, the banking and financial situations are still highly regulated and there is no way for any lending institution to download their risks in mortgage loans or property development loans onto someone else and have them pooled together to become a uh, synthesized uh, overkiller uh, weapon uh, as in the form of a subprime uh, loans. Whichever bank which lends the mortgage loan or property loans will be stuck with the a problem on its own balance sheet. That actually inadvertently creates a higher level of discipline when they do the review of the loan applications from the very beginning. And all, that means that in China there will be not, there will not be one synthesized, consolidated kind of a property bubble. It will actually involve multiple smaller and localized uh, bubbles uh, in China rather than one single uh, a big property bubble. Now, in recent years, there have already been runaway property prices in major cities. And this is partially because the Chinese people save a lot and the stock market in China, in Shanghai and in Shenzhen are not truly reflective of the underlying economic activities in China. This is mainly because many of the big and best Chinese companies are actually not listed domestically in Shanghai or in Shenzhen. And uh, there are actually a uh, lack of alternative investment opportunities. So if you have money, if you put it in the bank earning very low uh, interest income, you probably want to buy some property. And uh, uh, therefore there has been a tremendous amount of investment in property and uh, a runaway property prices, not only in big cities like Shanghai and Beijing, but also in second tier and third tier cities, they are catching up very quickly. And uh, uh, the banks have been uh, lending uh, a lot to mortgage loans as well as to developers. However, the land problem or the property bubble problem in China is very much involving uh, arms wrestling or gaming theory between the local governments which provide the land the developers as well as the consumers eventually. It is actually following very different logics in China. Right now, for the last year or so, the Chinese government has been very alarmed about the potential of further inflation in the property bubbles in China, and they have tried their best to deflate the bubble to the extent possible by controlling the demand. Basically, you need to be qualified in order to buy an apartment in Beijing or Shanghai, for example. And the screening process is very long, and very cumbersome. And the focus of the property development, according to the government encouragement and policy, has been shifted to low-income housing and uh, a rental housing. Now, whether there will be a soft landing or hard landing in China, we know that uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Lehman Brothers collapse, China actually was the first country in the world which came up with a strong 
stimulus package. The government's package was 4 trillion renminbi yuan, but if you add additional bank loans, etc., altogether it became about 9 trillion yuan. In China, we now have a rule of thumb. We basically say it's 10 trillion yuan total for the rescue package. And it has caused a lot of overhang because most of the money went into the infrastructure. Part of the money has been diverted into property development, etc. So the, uh, 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 the big uptake in the economic activities as a result of the pumping in of 10 trillion renminbi yuan into the economy in the immediate aftermath of the outbreak of the financial crisis actually helped stabilizing the economic situation in China for a while, but also uh, helped the rest of the world in uh, 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 stopping at the abyss. Because otherwise, I would say, if China did not take such dramatic action in 2009, uh, probably China would have plunged further. Uh, and the chart that Professor Schiller showed you just now about the sharp decline in China probably would be much worse uh, than uh, anticipated. But inadvertently, I think whatever China did uh, also helped the rest of the world uh, in staving off a major plunge into a depression. Uh, however, we are now suffering from the overhand of this uh, big stimulus uh, package, and uh, the uh, government is very much committed in containing the growth in this regard. In China, I would say, because the Chinese GDP has been growing at about 10% for 33 years in a row, and this is almost unprecedented. If you look at post-war Japan, they managed to achieve very similar economic growth rate for about one or two or uh, decades or longer. But in China, it's 33 years in a row, and there is no immediate sign of slowing down or declining. And even though the final number is not yet available right now, but the general consensus is that GDP growth in 2011 uh, will be about 9.2% or 9.2%, uh, 3%. As a rule of thumb, the Chinese government is committed to maintaining a minimum of 8% annual GDP growth. Why? Why such imperative of maintaining 8% GDP growth? Let me uh, talk about that very briefly. Uh, this is because over the past 30 years or so, uh, one of the fundamental policies in China is to maintain employment, is to make sure that the government's responsibility in creating jobs will be achieved. And in the more recent decades, as a rule of thumb, each 1% GDP growth in China will translate into about 1 million to 1.2 million new jobs every year. That means 8% GDP growth will help the Chinese government to create about 10 million new jobs. And you are talking about 10 million new jobs need to be created every year. And when we look at you know, the 8.9 or 8.5% unemployment rate in the United States, when we look at the unemployment situations in many countries, especially countries in the southern part of Europe, etc., uh, we realize that actually uh, uh, China actually has done the right thing. That is from the very beginning and uh, consisting, persisting three decades in a row without, relent without relenting at all uh, in creating jobs, in maintaining the uh, economic growth rate, etc. So I think uh, uh, even though the Chinese government's official target for GDP growth per year in the 11th five-year plan period, that is between 2011 to 2015, is 7%. But normally the government will come up with a more conservative uh, GDP target, whereas in implementing that, it will be a little bit higher than that. Uh, therefore, I personally think there will be no hard landing in China. What will be a hard landing in China? As a general rule of thumb, again, upon uh, among the Chinese decision makers, any growth rate at or below 7% in China will be called a hard landing. But if you look globally, if you put this in context, 7% GDP growth for any European countries or for any OECD countries will be a very, very robust and high GDP growth. But in China, we will call that a hard landing. I personally don't think 2012 will have an overall annual 
GDP growth at 7% or lower, causing a hard landing in China. For several reasons. One is that the government is still very vigilant, it's vigilant, it's very much on top of that. And also, as we will talk about later, 2012 will be a major year of transition in China. As a rule of thumb, again, the Chinese government and Chinese economy will behave very prudently and cautiously in the year of big transition. So I don't think there will be major surprises in China and the government and the corporate circles, financial institutions will really pool all resources together to make sure that, generally speaking, stability uh, can be uh, maintained. And it is also noteworthy to know that the largest GDP province in China, the Guangdong province, which is just to the north of Hong Kong, recently announced that it will no longer compete with the second largest GDP unit, the Jiangsu province, on the GDP growth rate competition. Because you know each province in China is very much accustomed to competing with each other as to who grows its GDP faster, who has the largest GDP in China. But uh, Guangdong province, the largest GDP, which has the largest population in China, has already announced that it will no longer compete uh, on that basis. Now, because of the uh, shortage of time, uh, let me skip several pages, but you will be having the presentation material anyway. Uh, about this transition, as we now just now mentioned. Uh, the current incumbent generation of leaders in China is the fourth generation under Hu Jintao. And uh, the transition in China in, will be a little bit more complicated. It will involve at least three steps. That is, in October 2012, there will be a party congress, the 18th party congress, and uh, the party general secretary's position will be transferred from Hu Jintao to Mr. Xi Jinping. And in March 2013, there will be uh, the National People's Congress, the parliament session in China, and the presidency, the prime minister, the uh, cabinet members will all need to be reshuffled. And most likely, uh, in 2014, the chairmanship of the Central Military Commission uh, will be uh, transferred. And uh, uh, the incoming fifth generation of leaders are expected to be very different from the incumbent fourth generation of leaders. However, I think one thing which is reassuring is that in China, ever since Deng Xiaoping re-emerged 30 years ago, the economic development and the political reform are based on two pillars. That is, maintaining stability at home and keeping peace in the world. And I don't think the new uh, incoming government will uh, deviate from this uh, overall uh, course of action in China. Now, what exactly will be China's ultimate goals? Uh, if you talk to the uh, inner circle leaders uh, and advisors in China, there is more or less this 20% rule. That means China wants to reach eventually 20% of the global economy, not on a PPP basis, uh, but on a nominal exchange basis. Actually, IMF already said if you use the PPP basis, China's economy 2011 already reached about 14.5% of the global total, but China wants to use the nominal exchange rate. That means the Chinese economy need to double in the coming uh, uh, years or so. China also wants to reach about 20% of the global trade. You know China has already become the largest trading nation both on the import side and on the export side. But that means to reach 20% of the global trade, China need to double again its import and export. But also very interestingly, uh, China wants to reach about 20% of the intellectual property rights. Um, Thomson Reuters reported that in 2011, even though the final number is not yet forthcoming right now, China will surpass Japan and the United States as the number one uh, nation in new patent applications. China also wants to be 20% uh, of the Fortune 500 companies. The latest account I did uh, was that China accounted for about 42 per, uh, members of the uh, Fortune 500 companies if we exclude those from Taiwan and Hong Kong. That means, again, that the number uh, would need to uh, double. So I think soft landing or hard landing is not very material to us. What we want to achieve is a safe landing, but also it's not landing for landing's purpose. It's a landing for the pickup, again, of the uh, robust growth. Now, what is my view of China 2020? I would say 
before I wrap up. By 2020, China will be the largest economy in the world, larger than the United States. China will account for 20% or more of the global economy. And China will account for 20% or more of the global trade. By 2020, China will, the renminbi yuan in China will become an important reserve currency in the world. And the Chinese population may be smaller than that of India's, but the Han Chinese will remain the largest single ethnic group in the world. The Chinese Communist Party will remain the ruling party in China, and China in 2020 will prepare for the transition from the fifth generation to the sixth generation of leaders. Um, given the time constraint, I will stop here, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor Gao, for a very interesting speech. Thank Not you. only giving us Chinese insights, but also compared to the West, which you seem to know just as well as China, in my mind. Um, yeah, we have a question from the front row. Do I have to stand up or do, can I sit down? Sit down is fine. <laughs> I think I'm the oldest member of the, of the No, crowd you're not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for a wonderful speech. Thank you. Fabulous English spoken. I wish we in Denmark could find people able to speak Chinese as well as you speak English. Thank you very much. Well, I actually speak better Chinese than my English. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is staggering to see what has happened in China since 1979 when I paid my first visit to Beijing. Hotel Beijing was the tallest building in Beijing. Uh, you have produced figures of, of growth, figures of, of, uh, of uh, yeah, growth and marvelous, marvelous progress, and you do it with pride. I suppose it is justified pride you can do that. But I have, a, uh, I have very little time now, but I have a single question. Is it the a policy of imperialism we are seeing here. You, you meet in, the, in Africa, and I have some business both in Africa and in American countries. There you meet uh, Chinese companies uh, investing in different projects, not always very popular. They, they don't speak English as well as you do when they come along. And, uh, some of the local population, uh, they say, why can't they stay at home? We don't really want all their money. I'm not one of them, but, <laughs> but uh, I think we feel an imperialism, which is, uh, there's a historical evidence that this is in the Chinese gene. Because if you go back, I think you said something about at the beginning of the speech. Uh, if you go back to uh, the 17th century or even before you see Chinese expansion in, in uh, the Asian in the Asian area now is that what we can expect that's all thank you very much um, as a macro point I want to say for a nation which is famous for building the Great Wall imperialism probably is not in its gene and uh, also for a nation whose Admiral Zheng He launched seven voyages in the world ahead of Columbus and sailed all the way to the Horn of Africa. And then they voluntarily decided to go back to China with some giraffes rather than settling in any of the territories in between China and the Horn of Africa. That also means that probably imperialism was not in the gene of that nation. So. When you go to China, I hope you will visit the Great Wall, stand on the Great Wall, and try to imagine yourself, whether you are on the inside of the Great Wall or on the outside of the Great Wall. If your mentality is that you are on the inside of the Great Wall, you will realize that nation, that civilization, probably is not built for imperialism. Now, you talked about Africa. I actually talk about Africa a lot. I think, first of all, the 
taste of the pudding is in eating it. That means it's better for us to ask, in my term, our African brothers and sisters for their view as to what exactly you know, is happening, whether they welcome the Chinese investment in Africa or not. Of course, when you talk about Africa and Chinese investments, there are numerous Chinese companies, both state-owned, government, private-owned, big and medium and smaller enterprises. There, there must be some bad apples in any basket of apples, of course. But overall, I think the Chinese investment into Africa is welcomed mostly by the African countries, and China has really single-handedly been building infrastructures in Africa, starting from the Zambia-Tanzania uh, railway back in the 1970s. And uh, um, my, my personal view is that if the Chinese investment into Africa makes some of the European countries or America or unhappy, that's not a problem. I think the more investment into Africa by either China or India or Japan, America, European countries, the better, because African need investments. African need capacity building. So the more we can do together investing in Africa, the uh, better. So I would say, in summary, very quickly, I don't think China is an imperialist at all. I think uh, the Chinese globalization is very much based on using trade as the means without any backing of the military and hopefully it will be eventually creating a win-win situation for us all. Thank you, sir. Yeah. We have another question from Frau Westergaard. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gao, um, some people in Europe uh, have been hoping that uh, China will bail out uh, some of the Eurozone countries uh, buying uh, bonds uh, from the big countries. Um, would you comment on the thinking of this in, uh, in Beijing? Uh, first of all, I think China has already purchased some of the bonds from some of those countries in southern part of Europe. And as I mentioned just now, uh, discussions are going on uh, between China and several other European countries, as well as between China and the uh, uh, European Central Bank and IMF. Uh, France and Germany in particular uh, talk to uh, the Chinese government a great deal. Now, um, there are several things which can stand out in this one. One is that, philosophically speaking, China prefers to have a stronger Europe, uh, mainly because China does not want to have a, what we call single polar world dominated by one particular country. So having a stronger unified Europe actually helps uh, achieve balance in the world. That's number one. So there is a political incentive for China to make sure that Euro does not collapse, unity in Europe does not fall apart, etc. That's number one. Number two is that even though China tends to treat you know, Germany, France separately as an individual trading partner, EU as a whole is now the largest trading partner to China. If Europe really deteriorates and the productivity in Europe uh, falls apart, China also suffers. So in the Chinese case, there is a vested interest for China to cooperate closer with Europe to make sure there is robust growth in China, in Europe, and China and Europe can really work together. Now, thirdly, I think the more recent uh, voices coming out of Beijing is that China wants to help, and China can actually, uh, uh, China is actually one of the very few countries right now who may have the political will to help and also who may have the financial resources to help. But China does not want to make any investment which will eventually be highly condemned or criticized by the Chinese people, mainly because right now there is also increasing transparency and they do not want to see China make any investment which eventually will be money-losing proposition. So how to make that circle, how to turn that corner to make sure that the European uh, countries can have investment from China to help stabilize the situation, but also to make sure that whatever Chinese investments into these very difficult situations will not generate huge losses for China eventually. I don't think we have reached that point. I think all the parties are working very hard to work towards that goal. Thank you. I can see some more of you have asked for the microphone. However, you also need some refreshments now. I know the flight schedule of Victor Gao, and he's not going home soon. So we will hand him over to the press, and I'm sure if you have questions, you can also address them during the hour lunch later today. 
um, kindly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now we have refreshment in the hall and to the right. We will start ringing the bell again at half past 11 and give you a little leeway. Thank you.